Hello, friend. We're going to look at Daniel 2, 20 to 23, and we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, the, what Daniel 2 is about. So, before we begin, let's pray. Father in heaven, please. Bless us with the presence of your holy teacher, without whom all our teachings and all our listenings will be in vain. Father, we want your word and not our own. And as we delve into your wonderful word, may they speak life unto us and Show us what must shortly come to pass. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, Daniel chapter 2. Basically, we're going to summarise from the beginning to the point that we're going to read. Then we're going to summarise the rest. So, first of all, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, he forgot his dream, he called in his magicians and so on to interpret the dream, they couldn't, he decided that they'd be killed because they've been telling him lies all this time, and Daniel was among the wise men, and he would have been one of the people that were killed. So when Ariok came to him, he asked why the decision was so hasty from the king. And Arioc explained what happened. Daniel went in before the king and asked for some time. He got time. He went in with his friends and told him them what happened. Now that's very interesting. Praying together in groups where two or three are gathered, you know. It's a very very encouraging and a very encouraging thing and a great privilege so he got his friends to pray with him and the Lord revealed to Daniel the dream and this is what he said in response in thanksgiving to God for giving him the answer he said Verse 19, then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever for wisdom. And I didn't read the whole of verse 19. Anyway. For wisdom and might are his and he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things he knoweth. What is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me. Now what we desire of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. So everything is solved. And... He was so thankful. He blessed the Lord for having control over the nations. God is allowing the devil to show what his kingdom is all about. But in order for things not to get too bad, too soon, he steps in sometimes. He steps in many a time to order events so that things don't degenerate too fast. And this is what this, this whole image is about. That we are going to be looking into. And it's interesting, he says, he giveth knowledge 
unto, let's see it, wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. So those that have wisdom, he gives wisdom. Those that know understanding, he gives knowledge. It sounds a bit to me like what Jesus said when he spoke the parables. He said that to him that has, more shall be given. But him that has not, that which he has shall be taken from him. In other words, when you appreciate God's word, when you recognise you have something, and you want more, more will be given to you. When the disciples heard the parables, they didn't just say, oh, what on earth is he talking about, and go away. They're like, there's something for me. And they went and asked Jesus to explain, and they got more. But mm -hmm. those who saw it as a common thing, oh, this isn't really something that I really um, am interested in. That which they had was taken from them. And that is what's being spoken about here. So let's go into the dream. Daniel goes before the king. He says, we've got the answer. The Lord in heaven has given the answer. He didn't say, you know, I have been able to read in, you know, gather the files of your memory or something and, and decipher your thoughts upon your bed or some kind of craziness and um, bring all the glory to himself. But he said, no, it's God who reveals the secrets. And he reveals it for the king's sake and for the, his people's sake, that they may know what must shortly come to pass. And... He goes through it. There was a statue, head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, uh, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. Then he goes into the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, Babylon, was the head of gold. The next kingdom that was to come on the scene was one that's inferior, it's silver, but it's the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. Then there would be another one inferior to that one that would come up, belly and thighs of brass. Now if we look at history, what kingdom was that? What was after Medo Persia? Greece. After Greece is an iron kingdom. And it's funny because they use a lot of brass in Greece as well. And and in and in um in the next kingdom after Greece it's Rome and they use a lot of iron didn't they in their armories. The next kingdom legs of iron. The next kingdom division. Iron and clay mixed together, divided nations of Europe, and also symbolising um, church and state union. We know where we are in this image, it's right at the feet. Now, this is what the whole of Daniel is actually built on. You go to the other chapters, you know, some historical chapters are to show us what will happen in the end of time. There's going to be an image to the beast and so on. We're not going to go into that. And then there's um, stories about Nebuchadnezzar and how he realised the Lord is God. He's going to be in heaven one day. We're going to be able to ask him to tell his story in person. Then chapter 5, um, the end of Babylon. When Babylon falls. 
and in chapter 6, just giving us little insights into the time of trouble, how there'll be spies and things like that. And the law would be a religious law because they can't find any fault with God's command of keeping people other than that. Then the beasts in chapter 7. Now that is just a reiterating, um, talking, expanding a bit more on, showing a bit more of the characteristics of the metal man of Daniel 2. And talking especially about those feet of iron and clay, which is when the little horn power comes up, amongst whom the little horn power comes up. It comes up when they're the vision in the Roman Empire. And then you've got Daniel 8, which talk about the ram and the goat, and how there'll be a little horn again. It really, really talks a lot about this little horn because this is the power that is key to God's people knowing and identifying in these last days. It is none other than the papacy. According to the Bible. There's no other power that can fit than Daniel 11. It's building on the same image. Going right through the kingdoms down to the feet of iron and clay to the point when the papacy will persecute God's people. There'll be a pushback against him with some the king of the south so be it and there would be um, a bit of lax and then he would push back and after that he would enter into the glorious land and would try and ruin the church of God and eventually he's going to just really try and destroy God's church plant his tabernacles in the church he wants to destroy it when the king planted their tabernacle inside of a city it meant capture it meant destruction and at that time Michael stands up Jesus is coming the stone that was cut out without hands that we didn't talk about just now which we should have in Daniel 2 there was a stone that cut out without hands, smote the image on his feet, and the whole image crashed into smithereens. That shows that each part of the image is one great system of Babylon. The Babylon in Revelation is... the papacy as identified in Daniel. It's a wonderful book. This is a book that was closed right up until the time of the end, which is 1798, when Berthier took the Pope captive. Then people started studying and understanding more about Daniel. Not all of Daniel was closed, but certain vision, the 2300 day prophecy, was closed. And people started to understand things, and things opened up to give us an understanding of the events that will take place and that have taken place to encourage us and to let us know what to do. Read this book, it's an open book and Revelation in conjunction with it because Revelation and Daniel are linked and understand that God is in control of the nations we don't need to be involved with politics you look at Daniel Daniel himself he was happy in Judah not bothering with anything like that 
the only time he ended up in politics in the Babylonian school system was when he was dragged from Jerusalem to Babylon and forced to do that. Otherwise he would have been happy with his um, Judean Israelite teaching and and um, the the actual system that God had set up in Israel. Let's be happy with what God has given us and not try and meddle with politics. God's hand is in control and whatever he decides will happen. And in the end, Jesus will come. We're at the end. I can't go into it in this um, little devotion, but since 1844, there's been nothing more God's been waiting for but that his people perfect Christian characters Spread the gospel of the kingdom to the entire world, then the end will come. He's waiting on us. And he won't be waiting forever, because people are getting ready. God's remnant is being made up. There's a revival happening in this church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. And people are starting to understand what the Seventh-day Adventist church had been given in the beginning. We've been given a message which was to be reformatory to the entire globe. All of Christianity was supposed to be brought to this message and everyone was to make their decisions. It was to prepare people for escape from this planet. We're starting to come back to realisation and... I want you to be a part of the movement. Be a part of it. And if you're in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and understand um, the crisis that we've been through, God wants you to be a part of the solution and not part of the problem in wanting to leave and wanting to do all sorts of different things and trying to come up with different doctrines so that we can show that we are wrong, even though when those doctrines are actually examined, they fall flat on their face. We've got to focus on what God has given us to do. He called us to present the three angels' messages, calling people out of Babylon. And he has given us the spirit of prophecy as a guide. And we know from the spirit of prophecy that this church will never be Babylon. So he never called us to start calling anyone out of it. He's called us to call people out of Babylon, out of the fallen churches who have fallen because they have not received the Sabbath truth and because they have not received the truth of the state of the dead and so on. God wants people that will be filled with his spirit to make a difference in his church even though it might not have much effect with the majority it will not have much effect on the majority in fact but God's truth will triumph in the end we will just want to be a part of it just do our duty that's all we need to do. Just do our duty. And they are choosing this for those who aren't Seventh day Adventists. They might you might not know about the truths that are found in Daniel and the Revelation. Revelation is not a sealed book. Daniel has been unsealed since seventeen ninety eight the certain portions of Daniel that had been sealed and we've got a message for you which is important and we want you to consider these things 
and come on board with the movement to finish the work in righteousness.